1939, a young man by the name Bob Kane was approached by DC Comics editor Vin Sullivan about creating a new superhero. In an attempt to capitalize on the success of DC's first hero, Superman, Kane took the weekend to work up an idea. Few inspirations being Zorro, The Shadow, Sherlock Holmes, and a Leonardo da Vinci sketch. The following Monday, Kane presents a concept and a few sketches of this character, whose name was in fact inspired by a quote included in the Da Vinci sketch, Your creation shall have no other wings than that of a bat, giving him the Batman, hyphen included. The character becomes a massive success. The rest is history. However, there is one forgotten detail missing from this origin, a key element not to be overlooked. Bob Kane didn't create Batman alone. That's right, everyone. Today, we're here to discuss the forgotten father of Batman, Bill Finger. I'm Blue Dragon 5, and with me to embark on this journey, to solve this riddle, the man who's best suited for the job, Mystery! Ha <laughs> ha! Thank you, thank you. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's the best person to solve a mystery? Mr. E. Like that. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining me, Mr. E. Uh, so, w w what do you know about Bill Finger overall, Mr. E? Well, I know his real name is Milton Finger. I think Bill was just like a nickname. He was born in Denver, Colorado, born on February 8, 1914. And he did other comic books besides Batman, but Batman's his most popular one. He did, um, he wrote, um, for the original. Green Lantern, and he wrote, I think he started the Batman comic, he wrote for Detective Comics, and that's probably the more popular stuff. He kind of, the when Bob Kane first brought the idea of Batman, Batman had um, a domino mask, he, he had some red stuff, red costume bits on him. And he had wings on him. He didn't have any gloves. And that was what he looked like. It was Bill Finger who had the idea of putting on an actual cow instead of a domino mask, taking the wings off of him and giving him a cape, giving him gloves and taking out the red parts of the costume to make the costume that we have today. And it was heavily influenced by the Phantom. The costume was heavily influenced by the Phantom. Very true, very true, but let, let's let's go to the beginning again, just kind of just kind of go through it all, just kind of be, be thorough, because the reason we're doing this, by the way, because it is, would you agree, Mystery, it is kind of a crime that Bill Finger has, has gone on forgotten, when he is basically, he, yeah, he's the other forgotten father of Batman, you know, I mean, it's, you know, you got Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. That's a team right there. And the yeah. writer and the artist, they're well regarded as the fathers of Superman. Yet, for, they're like the Jor-El and the Jonathan Kent. But here we only, we only we got uh, a Thomas Wayne. We're forgetting, maybe Martha, maybe not Martha Wayne, but still the other, the other half of Thomas Wayne, Bill Finger. Well, I think that part could be easily um, debated on why we're forgetting about Bill Finger, because it would be more like, it was actually Bob Kane's idea. It was his, like, creation. It was his Batman. He created it. But what we don't know is that it was Bill Finger who thought of the characters' names, who, like, actually invented all the other characters. It was him that thought of the villains. It was him that thought of the name of the great city that we know. It was him that practically in that thought of the idea of almost half of the stuff in the Batman comic. So, yes, you're right. He should be in, like, the history books as one person that also, it should be, even though some people say, oh, it should be Bill Finger and Bob Kane, it should be Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Well, let's let, let's kind of, let's build up to the, to the grand debate, shall we? Let's go to the early years of uh, Bill Finger. Let's get to know the guy a little. Yeah. So yeah, as 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 said previously, you know, born February eighth, uh, nineteen fourteen, Denver, Colorado. But uh, he moved to the to the Bronx, which he was a uh, uh, in Bronx, New York. He's about ten blocks away from Bob Kane. In fact, they both went to the same high school. I don't think they really 
talk to each other much in high school from what I from what I've learned. But uh, uh, back in those days, uh, uh, Bill Finger's father, I believe, was a tailor, and uh, Bill Finger himself became a shoe salesman. And uh, in uh, 19, uh, 1938, he really met Bob Kane. And uh, basically, Bob Kane approached him and asked him if he like you know like to work on scripts because Finger always had a passion for writing. Mm-hmm. Eventually, he'd uh, take on Batman as a full time job. Well, I understand, but you know, he's basically he was a for the majority of his whole career he was a ghostwriter. He was a guy who really got little, absolutely very little to no credit for the most part. But he was just a ghostwriter. He was a guy who was had to help. It's a really commendable thing, I guess. Yes, his first, I believe, one of his first actual jobs as the ghostwriter was of the comic strip Rusty, or the two like two separate comic strips, Rusty and Clip Carson. I think those were his first two. Yeah, because you have to remember, Bob Kane didn't just start out with superheroes. A lot of, back in those days, he had to start out in the industry. He would do comic strips, you know, stuff that appears in the paper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, basically, uh, that's how they kind of worked together. The finger would uh, you know, help kind of craft the story. Bob Kane would really be the artist for the most part for those. But, you know, Kane, uh, back then it was like a little simpler storytelling for the comic strips. So it's, it's just more like gags in those or just like an adventure strip. So basically, uh, this happens, this happens, just like kind of more, more just kind of just grab the audience's attention for the comic strips. However, comic books, that, that's more uh, something that required storytelling, which, you know, Bill Finger had a great great talent for. And I like the, the fact that uh, Bill Finger and Bob Kane, they would discuss you know, all, all this stuff. They would discuss the ideas they had, and they would toss around ideas and concepts and stuff at uh, Poe Park, which was in uh, New York around the Bronx. Yeah, it's just kind of a nice idea, I think. It's these two kind of these two greats just kind of tossing around ideas like, "Whoa, what if you did this? What if you did that?" I like a creative atmosphere. Yeah, um, nowadays in comics you still sort of have that, but it's not as um uh <clears throat> not as heard of nowadays because it's more like now when a company gives you um a a character or a product to write for. It's prob- practically like, okay, this is the artist, this is the writer. Writer, you go do your own thing, you write your story. And then um, when it's time for the artist to start drawing, that's when you'll give him the script, and then the artist will start drawing. Yeah, yeah. they're just kind of, they're, they're just kind of thrown just- into it. Yeah. No, oh, it's just like they're, uh, yeah, it's like the Thrones. It's not as collaborative as it, uh, as it, as it was back then. It's just kind of like incidentally, like you met a guy uh, who's also a writer, and you, you toss around some ideas. It doesn't really happen like that anymore. I think well, today we're starting to get a little bit of that, but you know, more, it's more constricting conditions such as you know, you're sworn to secrecy, or again, you're just kind of thrown into it by whoever because everyone's working on a project nowadays. Like Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, that's a fantastic team right there. You know, they're a dynamic duo. Those two. Yeah. And they're doing. They're writing a great property that Bill Finger and Bob Kane helped create. Very true. Now about the uh, about the, the costume you were talking about, the original Batman costume. So essentially, uh, Bob Kane he works up an initial sketch because, as, as we mentioned in the, in the opening, there uh, he's basically superheroes are going over big because uh, Superman was a huge success, and basically uh, everyone was striving to come up with the next big thing, the next big superhero. So. Uh, the editor, uh, you know, Bob Kane walks into the editor's office and he says, "Well, hey, listen, I got a super. I got. What if I came with a hero for you? Would it, how much would it pay?" He says, "Like pay like uh, fifty bucks." And back then, that was a lot of money. Yeah, okay. so, okay, I'll be a hero by Monday. So he takes the weekend. He comes. He works up a sketch, and that sketch was originally is more of a Superman looking character who was like in a red red suit. You had the had the bat wings still, but yeah, you're right. Domino mask. Uh, he didn't have gloves, which is kind of silly. He didn't have potlets uh, either. He didn't have the popular yeah. gauntlets. Yeah. It's not much. Again, it was too Supermanish. But then uh, Bill Finger, uh, brilliantly, he had a lot of great suggestions, you know, for the custom. He basically created the bat suit. You know, yeah. he went for the black and gray look and you know, gave him the gloves and the, the cape and cow, which started out from him saying, you know, you got to give him a, a silhouette, like a bat silhouette by raising the uh, by, by raising the mask first off to look like a bat, which in itself, is is a great idea because think about it, mystery. Bill Finger created the famous bat silhouette. You know that that's that, used that Batman the animated series opening. It's the bat silhouette. It's awesome. 
If it wasn't for Bill Finger, we would not have the silhouette. Or we probably would, but it would not be the same silhouette that we all know today. Yeah. Also, he came up, uh, interesting enough, he came up with the white eye slits thing, you know, because uh, early in those days they were, you know, they used, uh, you could see the character's eyes through the mask, but he was the first one, I think, uh, well, I'm saying, maybe the Phantom did this, but it, uh, for DC at least, they had the white eye slits for one character, and that was really cool looking, you know. You can't really see what they're thinking, but they're more than human almost. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, like, really... it's, cause it's sort of like once you see the eyes, you can tell everything about a person. But if you can't see the eyes, then you have no idea what the person is thinking, what he's going to do. And with, when you cover up the eyes, that opens up a realm of complete possibility uh, possibilities of you can go so far with the character. You can go as far as you want with the character, but you'll never be able to see the expression on their eyes and see what they're really thinking. Because, in my opinion, the eyes tell you everything about a person. Yeah. And think about it, if the eyes are the window to the soul, to you know, use the old saying, then you can't really see into Batman's soul. That makes him all the more intimidating. Exactly. Yeah, that works perfectly, because originally uh, uh, Bob Kane, was going for a more vigilante angle, because Bob Kane, when he was a kid, he, he loved Zorro. He was part of like a club of Zorro kids, and he loved them. That's why, you know, that's why Batman goes to the movie theater to see Zorro, and that's kind of where the inspiration came from, because he really loved playing with the vigilante angle, yet Bill Finger, what he pushed for was kind of the scientific detective, and that's why the first issue of Batman is the case of the chem chemical syndicate. You know, it's kind of a little bit of science but he's really mainly a detective, and it's kind of mixing of the two visions for Batman, which are both equally good visions, but work so well, melded together. Exactly. A vigilante detective. It's like taking the concept of an old 40s private eye, but taking it to a new level. Exactly. And did you did you mention the fact that when um, Batman was created, not only would he, was he um, based off of the great swashbuckler Zorro, but he was also based off of the detective, the Shadow. Yes. So that kind of also helped with the background of, well, he's a detective. Because if it was not for this character, he would not be exactly what we, but we're not a, what we know him as. He would not be the Dark Knight detective. Yeah, and with the, uh, with the detective angle for the character, they really, uh, uh something Bill Finger strived for, from my understanding, is that he really kind of strived for that noir feel, which really works, you know, it's just logical progression, if he's a detective, he's going to be kind of a dark setting, you know, in the city, a lot of crime, so it's kind of going for a noir feel, like the Maltese Falcon in a way, which is kind of cool. Like, that first issue of Batman, it's just Batman going around, a lot of people are dying, and it's like, oh man, what's, what's happening, what's, what's the world coming to, so to speak, and he's investing. He's investigating. He has to smash his way out of a thing, being very resourcefully using, like, a... A gun. Uh, well, yeah, of course he used the gun, but I mean, like, he smashes his way out using, like, a wrench or something. It wasn't even, like, classic utility belt gadgets. Exactly. Just just random objects that you could find anywhere. And then... Yeah, like, he was... Yeah, like a handkerchief to, uh, like, get some gas out of his face. Exactly. Out of all of what Bill Finger did... The only problem he did was he gave Batman a gun. That was the only problem. Yes, but that was kind of ba you know that's kind of based on like soldiers carrying guns and yeah, kind of I guess. And it was the times where it was regular that if you were besides Superman who didn't need a gun, if you were just a regular person and you wanted to go out and save the day, you needed a gun. Plus, I mean, the Shadow had a gun, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, like that's kind of another thing. Maybe it kind of bled over from the the, the shadow inspiration too. I mean, thing, but it's like a you know, vigilantes would would use guns. Yeah, I mean, we don't know exactly uh, how much bled over uh, from Bill Finger or Bob Kane or not, because again, it could be the vigilante shadow angle, or it could just be that. But either way, yeah, it's a, it's a progression. Now, thankfully, it was dropped in, in later years because it makes no sense. Batman using a gun because, you know, his parents were killed by guns. He would abhor that weapon because you know, Batman's the best proponent for an anti-gun ever. And I believe that once they dropped that aspect of him carrying a gun, it just made the character progress into what we know today. Into oh, yeah. from the person oh, yeah. that when he was first created, oh, willy-nilly, I'm going to use a gun, to 
I hate guns. If I even see a gun, I will just hold it. I will see what I'm going up against, but then I will destroy it. Yeah. Another thing that Bill Finger really did that really kind of cemented uh, what, what kind of mind this guy was and what he really brought to the bad books was that he did a lot of research. And something that – it's a mark of a good writer – when they do a lot of research for something, like uh, even Scott Snyder working on Batman today, he does a lot of research. You can tell, like, reading Court of Owls. He's read a lot of literature, and he reads, like, uh, Zero Year, he's, like, a lot of Egyptian artifacts. And he, the guy's very knowledgeable. And even reading Death of the Family, you could see how much psychological stuff he probably researched. But he, Scott Snyder, what he researched, just to get that story in the Joker, in the relationship yeah. between the Joker and Batman. Like the whole thing about like uh, the human eye and like how like the five the five points of the human eye that's exactly. that thing. Yeah, but uh, the thing that uh, Bill Finger did because you know a lot of comics usually end up in a lot of settings like you know like old abandoned factories and so forth. Uh, Bill Finger would actually he would go visit some of these factories you know for kind of research and kind of we get ideas that way. So like okay, what if uh, uh, what if it ended up here and what what could happen what could take place here like maybe that saw blade gets used in the action you know, who knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's nice touches. That's a nice touch. But also, I want to mention this uh, in, briefly in regards to credits before we really get into that. All right. Uh, uh, Bill Finger, he uh, he did technically get credit very rarely, but when he did, it's like in these really tiny boxes. You get like one little box. And this it was is, you know, Bill, Bob Kane Bill would always get the big one because it was like, oh, it's my character. I created him. Boom, Bob Kane. But, yeah, but I mean, like, Bill Finger wouldn't even be on the cover. I mean, he'd be, like, on, like, the inside, like, in a little corner there, and just, like, yeah. one little blue box saying Bill Finger. Which, I'm not just, I'm not saying anything bad about Bob Kane, but... Likewise. It, it's it's just one of those things where Bill Finger should have gotten a little more credit, because credit is earned, and I think he earned so much since he practically created the Batman character of what we know now, so he should get a little more credit than just Bob Kane. It should be exactly. Bob Kane and Bill Finger, not just Bob Kane. At the very least, it should be 50-50. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but first I want to highlight uh, a few of the... I know we, you kind of touched on this mystery, but let, let's kind of get into the distinct creations of, of Bill Finger, the ones that really kind of made their mark in the, in the Batman universe, so to speak. It was uh, the first and foremost... Uh, Bill Finger was the guy who came up with the death of the parents. That was his. That was his idea. Yes, it was. Of course, one of the most brilliant origins. It's it's, simp- it's short and simple, really. His parents were gunned and down you, and out. And when you think about Batman's origin, created by Bill Finger, if you continue to read or look at other characters' origins, you begin to see the trend of if it was not for Bill Finger and Batman's origin. Almost half the characters that we know now would not exist because their origins is very similar to Batman's origins. To go to make a an example, a better, a close example is Spider-Man, to yeah. where the two people that Bruce Wayne looked up to, um, of his parents, the one person that Peter Parker looked up to the most, his uncle Ben, was killed. So it's one of those things where, because Bill Finger wrote that origin, he was able to inspire other other writers and other creators to practically so, sort of use that same formula, but able to use it in a different way. Yeah, and if you really want to get into like some some Bob Kane Bill Finger semantics, if you will, but. Uh... Uh, a thing that kind of is interesting is that with the death of the parents, yeah, it's a Bill Finger notion. But uh, with Bob Kane, really, he's kind of he's adding a little. Obviously, he's adding the visual look there, but also he's adding some uh, some colorful elements. Like you know, think about it. they go see a movie. What's the movie? Bob Kane's favorite, of course, uh, Zorro, which kind of sets in that sort of uh, the swashbuckler vigilante angle for Batman's inspiration in later years. He's kind of yeah, Bob Kane's kind of adding the color and the substance to the world with this great pathos that's given to us by Bill Finger. It's a good team. Dynamic there, yeah. But of course, other things. You know, uh, Bill Finger he named them. Uh, in regards to Robin, and when you think about the Robin, you're about to go to the Robin aspect. Um, Bob Kane, uh, Bill Finger, and Bob Kane. They both wanted. Um, well, I think it was just um, Bob Kane at first, 
that wanted Robin and like con- like was pushing Bill Finger like come on come on we need to think of something we need to think of a good we we need to we need to think of a good origin for Robin and then it was Bill Finger that was just like why don't we just kill his parents like make him a younger Batman but just have him like but make him similar to Batman but then at the exact same time make him different. Yeah, well, the way that came about, uh, Mr. from my findings, was that it's uh, – Bill Finger kind of noticed that uh, you know, Batman, he, he was a lot of di- – oh, sorry. With Batman, he would be alone a lot as, you know, this lone vigilante detective, and he would have, like, a lot of dialogue – not dialogue balloons, a lot of thought bubbles, just you know, kind of expressing to the audience, okay, what's Batman thinking of? Like, how's this investigating going? But at the time, they wanted to kind of give Batman someone to bounce off of. Some, to bounce some dialogue off of, so they didn't, it wasn't all just thought balloons. So uh, when that was when that was happening, then uh, I guess Bob King kind of figured, okay, well, let's give him a sidekick. Okay, we'll give him a we'll give him a sidekick then. Uh, then uh, give, give him a partner, like a Watson, to okay. his Sherlock Holmes, so to speak. And that was yeah, that was a notion of that. They're kind of thinking of origins, and uh, Bill Finger came up. Okay, why don't you make him acrobats? Because I I forgot what Bob Kane had for him originally, but he said, okay, let's make him acrobats and have him die. And Bob Kane said, okay, why don't you make him a kid? So it's kind of, you know, uh, give and take there. But Bill Finger's got the main thing there. Like, yeah, it's someone tragically taking so Bruce has no other option than to take these guys in. Then, sorry, than to take Dick Grayson in. Because how can you refuse the boy that lost his parents in front of him, much like Bruce did, and give this young lad direction in his life? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, uh, famously, to all the car lovers out there, uh, Bill Finger came off the Batmobile. And the Batcave, and the large props. So it wasn't Dick Sprang. He drew them best, but he didn't create them. That was Bill Finger. It was all Bill Finger. Yep, the comically large prop, uh, large props. Yeah. You get in a whole bunch of villains he created. Yes, and some that's kind of funny later years. So like a lot of people kind of debate like who came up with who, with, like what Kane created and what Finger created. But the point is, yeah, it's kind of Finger created a little more than. Well, okay, I'll admit that a little more. The one character, lot. it's like you, they they talk about a lot of characters, but the one character that they debate without a doubt, like the the one that's most debated out of all of them, is the Joker. He is the one character that everyone's just like, well, who created this character? It, a lot of people, when you look at it, it'll just, or like when you look at the thing, it'll just say Bob Kane and Bill Finger. But then, well, there is a third one. Exactly. And that's what yeah. I'm about to go to. There's the third oh, sorry, go ahead. That, who claims that he was also involved, and that was Jerry Robinson. But this is pre- – um, Bob Kane, all that Bob Kane said was all Jerry Robinson did was come in and put a, gave them a Joker card, and that was yes. it. And – then they just like, oh, well, this Joker card looks like um, Conrad Veidt from The Man Who Laughs. It looks like that. So why don't we just make that character, the Joker? Yeah. Well, the thing about the thing about that with Jerry Robinson is that keep in mind, like uh, in the, the terms of the Bat brood of writers and artists, you know, you got the uh, Bob Kane, you got Bill Finger. Then afterwards, it kind of the other two big names would be Jerry Robinson being the third, and then I guess Dick Sprang yeah. in later years. But uh, yeah, Jerry Robinson, he did have a big part. I think he also like worked on. Yeah, I think he like uh, was one of those. I believe the terms like maybe not ghost artists, but kind of fill in artists. Like he would help Bob, you know, up with the. The art at times, and then he would kind of eventually he would take on his own art to do stuff. And uh, yeah, he did. Uh, he's well, it's well known for him designing and drawing the Joker. Yeah. Not that Bob Kane couldn't draw the Joker, but you know, it said it says here when I'm looking at it said Robinson Robinson himself said in that in that first meeting when I showed them the sketch of the Joker, Bill said it reminded him of Conrad Veidt and the Man Who Left. So it. It's practically showed that Robinson had a sketch already. Not only yeah. did he have the playing card, he had a sketch with him. Okay. So well, you, have to, you have to give uh, Robinson credit. He did have a lot to do with the, the character of the Joker, I mean, mainly in the visual motif and the look. But Finger gave him the character, and I guess, uh, what do you think Bob Kane brought to the Joker? I guess, well, consistency in the art, maybe, but stemming yeah. from Robinson's sketch. Huh. 
Oh, maybe uh, part of me wants to say maybe he suggested throwing Joker in for the uh, for the Batman number one issue, but that's I, I'm speculating though. And I remember Bill Finger's thing. He he did not. Bill Finger was was talked about being someone who did not like recurring villains. He did not like villains to reappear. He did not like them to continue on. And when he first wrote the first story with Joe Grant, or the first two, because Batman number one had multiple stories in it, because that's how it was back in the day. And Joker died. He was Joker. He killed the Joker in that first, in his first appearance. But yes. because of the reception of the character and all, it was just like, oh, I'll bring him back. And then I'll kill yeah, the nu- one. And then yeah, it was like the knife missed his heart. Yeah. And then when Joker s- appeared the next time, Oh, I'm gonna kill him this time. Oh, people liked him again. I gotta bring him back. So it was one of those things where Bill Finger really wanted to kill the Joker because he did not like recurring characters. But he, the fans loved him so much that he was just, he just had to bring him back every single time. Well, you know, the way I kind of like to think of it, and I could entirely be wrong here, but the way it just sounds to me is that uh, Bob Kane's kind of the, the the idea guy and kind of the overall overall picture. Like he has kind of like a kind of a glaze to it. You know, like he has like say on certain things, and Bill Finger, is, he's doing a lot of the legwork there. Yeah. And I like to think that Bob Kane's the guy who's saying, okay, well, what, let's bring this guy back because the fans want him back. I'm thinking that's Bob Kane's real stake in it, where Bill Finger, yeah, he's the one who's, who's really writing the stories. Bob Kane's out and flourishes here and there to feel kind of Batman, or at least visually feel Batman, after he's kind of gotten the a gist of Batman after, he, you know, Bill Finger kind of helped him out way back in the day with the design of Batman. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, well, yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of characters, but the most famous character, because this character's famous, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this mystery, is that, uh, uh, the character that technically Bill Finger is, is the only character Bill Finger openly got credit for, from what I hear, is the Riddler. No, uh, with Dick Sprang. I'm sorry, what? With Dick Sprang. He's cre- is, Riddler is credited as being created by Bill Finger and Dick Sprang. Oh, yes, 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 right, right. Well, yeah, yeah, and Julie Schwartz is, I believe, the one who kind of pushed for giving him credit on the Riddler. I could be wrong, because it was in the 60s. I think Schwartz was there in the 60s. Um, uh, in the 60s? That's when Ju- at the In the 1960s, that's when Schwartz kind of became the big boss, and that's when everything changed. You have to remember, Julius Schwartz, he was the he, he was the big head honcho there. He was like the, he was the was, magic maker. If it was not for Julius Schwartz, then DC Comics would not be what it is today. Very true. I mean, the big pioneers like Julius Schwartz and Jeanette Kahn, they're the ones that kind of, they allowed for all this, the great stuff to take place. Like, you know, the, the reinvention of the Flash and Green Lantern, that was Julius Schwartz. And we can't forget about another character, that it's just credited at Bill Finger, who created it, without Bob Kane, without any other person. This character was solely a Bill Finger character. The Calendar Man. Huh. That am looking at what I'm looking at right now. It's just that uh, the Calendar Man was another villain created by Bill Finger without input from Kane. Huh. So seeing okay. that, it's kind of like when it came to the villains, it Bill Finger must have had. It might have been in one instance where Bob Kane was like, "Oh, can you can you just make a villain? I can't. It's like my my. I'm trying to think, but I can't think of one." And then Bill Finger thought of Calendar Man. Well, you have to remember that Calendar Man's impact on the world, because think about it. Calendar Man, we got Long Halloween years later with that character, it's, and boy, that's a huge story, Long Halloween. But we have to remember, like, when Bill Finger first introduced Calendar Man, he was a guy in a costume wearing different dates on him with a cape. It, it was It's not the Calendar Man we know well, today. Well, true, but still, like, the namesake and just the calendar theme baddie, it still lasted for a while. And that, it reinvented, yes, but a big place without that character. I mean, who might have filled that role? You have to wonder. And what I'm looking at right now, it says on here that Finger, however, claimed that he created a villain as a caricature of the aristocratic type because stuffy English gentlemen reminded him of Empire Penguins. Which yeah, it's a penguin. Yeah. So, 
And it's also it says Chain drew the penguin after being inspired by seeing seeing an advertisement on the cool cigarette bags. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. which one to go with on that one because that well, have to... it could just be like oh they meshed heads together so it's like co-created but I don't know. Well, you have to remember a lot of these villains are kind of dispute. After Finger's death, I believe a lot of people dispute like who came up with who. In yeah. regards to the rights of these characters, and as for mentioning, like you think just with the Joker alone, you got Jerry Robinson thrown into the mix. Also, I mean, don't be wrong. All of these, all of these guys, in some respect, they had helped create this great character. And of course, then you have to kind of wonder, like, uh, who did the most of the legwork? Jerry Robinson. I think he kind of said, oh, "What about a character based on a playing card?" And he gave some sketches. Bill Fingers, okay, let's make a character around us, but Bob Kane said, "Let's bring him back a lot." That, that's how that one comes. But I mean, characters like uh, the Penguin, for instance, you got two uh, credible. Incredible ideas for like how the pain can be. Me personally, I kind of I believe Bob Kane because you know Bob Kane was a smoker, and that kind of makes sense to me. But yeah. uh, and he was an artist too. I mean, I'm just saying it kind of makes sense. But I could be entirely wrong. We don't know for certain because you know they're not around anymore, which is a shame. But you know, it's, yeah. But yeah, a lot of these these characters. But you know, Riddler for sure is uh, is a Bill Finger creation. He's an awesome creation. Would you like to talk about uh, the Riddler? Uh, okay. The Riddler is such a, in my opinion, <clears throat> and people would be disagreeing with me, like a lot of people will be disagreeing with me, once I say this little tidbit. Okay. In my opinion, the Riddler is an underrated character. Hmm. For Okay. And here are my reasons. Reason number one, whenever he's in a story, he's either... The small, a small antagonist that only appears shortly, or he's a large antagonist that we didn't know he was a major antagonist until the very end. So it, like hush. Yes, and that was when I read that story, and I actually when they did the reveal, I was just thinking to myself, you know, you could have insinuated a little more that the Riddler had more of a story to do. Or had a little more in, to, in the story to do than just that one little appearance in midway through the show and then, or in the comic and then in the end. Um, reason number two that I think he's underrated. Um, people really don't like him. People, Wait, people don't like the character. Because, what do you mean? Everyone loves the Riddler. Well, here are the people, the people that don't like him say he's just a ripoff of the Joker. And all he's doing is telling riddles instead of jokes and all that. And you know, it depresses me. Uh, like a friend of mine when dresses the Riddler for Halloween, yet everyone thought he was the Joker. I'm like, my jaws drop. Like, how do you confuse the two? Exactly. exactly. That. But people confuse the two just because of like the background and like how they do the crimes and all that. And the third reason why I think he's underrated is because. He's not used enough in any sort of media, in like outside of the comics. When you watch the television series, he's barely seen. And granted, when you do the animated series and you have the Riddler and you want him to appear more, you got to think of riddles. And I know that's hard, but I mean, come on. He needs to be in more. I mean, he, he doesn't even have to. He could be like a supporting character, not having the have that many riddles in there. He could be helping Batman in an episode. I don't well, know. Yeah. Well, you have a point. Like, uh, hey, the Riddler really, he has good one-off stories that are, you know, are good. And overall, you're right. doesn't really have that big, a lot of big stories doesn't really have a huge part until the end it's revealed like that. However, I'm kind of hoping it, it changes. The Riddler doesn't really get that many big stories. And I think like, currently with the Zero Year story, he's kind of being drawn to focus by someone who really loves the Riddler. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully that'll change for the, for Edward and, Enigma. And then I think of the movies and all that. He's only been in, if you want to be technical, he's been in two movies. But if you don't want to be technical, he's only been in one movie. And that second movie I was counting was the 1960s movie. Of course. That one movie was Jim Carrey, and all he was doing was doing a caricature of Frank Gorshin, Frank yeah. Gorshin's Riddler. All he did was make him a little more psychotic and a little more sadistic, which if they would have went the darker route for the 1960s um, Batman show, Frank Gorshin could have played that role perfectly. 
Um, but I would like to see the Riddler in a modern setting. In a, um, like, I really wanted to see him. I really wanted to see him in the Nolan trilogy. I really wanted, because I wanted to see what Nolan would do with the character. Right. And, and I see multiple people's idea of what they could have done. In one of them, I saw, I was like, okay, this was probably the best way you could have done it in the Nolan series. To where the Riddler was more of a computer hacker and all that. He had, he dealt with data and all that. And it's like, that's how he would send out the riddle, riddles was from his computer and he would just be watching everything. And when you watch, or when you play Batman Arkham City, Arkham Asylum, uh, all the Batman Arkham games, that's the character. That's practically what people want to see in a movie. So just take the character from the Batman Arkham series and, like, his background and everything, put it in a movie, and there you go. You have the best Riddler you could ever have in a movie. So that's why – those are my three reasons on why the Riddler is one of the most underrated characters in the Batman franchise. Yeah, but getting yeah, let's get back to Bill Finger. But the, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that about the Riddler because it just shows you like how how lasting these characters have been thanks to that initial you know that get that real foot in the door of of just a good story that kind of keep him in the public con- well not the public conscious keep him in the minds of the readers that kind of keep this feeling years on years later that you know this is a great character we got to bring this guy back and when he gets brought back seeing all these great things that we don't with this character and it goes from way back in the 60s to the Arkham games I mean tell you that's just the big leap of that character all thanks to Bill Finger but you know let's let's get into since we kind of talked about really let, let's get into oh by the way one last thing about just another thing he created before we move on to another topic about Bill Finger uh, did you know he came up with the Dark Knight nickname? No, I didn't. I did not know he, he did. created the Dark Knight. Yeah, so the, just the whole nickname, just the Dark Knight. That that's Bill Finger right there. That wasn't Bob Kane. That wasn't Jerry Robson. That wasn't Dick Spring. That was Bill Finger. I have I have a question for you. Did you know that he co-wrote a two-part episode in the Batman TV series, the live action? With the Clock King. Yeah. Oh yeah. The Clock King. <laughs> the Clock King's crazy crimes. The Clock King gets crowned. Yeah. Actually, in the 60s, that was when Finger was kind of, uh, in a way, he was kind of let go from DC. But it's, he can't really be let go that much because he technically didn't really work for him because he was a ghostwriter. Exactly. Which is kind of a shame, to be honest with you. But, uh, yeah, it's because uh, the problem was Bill Finger, yeah, he's kind of let go. But the reason uh, Bill Finger was fired around the 60s was because he uh, he took his time a lot, and that's not a bad thing. He took his time for quality, and a lot of the a lot of the writers and a lot of the editors, like some of them, were really accommodating, saying, "Well, okay, well, we're a little behind with this story, but when he delivers, boy, does he deliver." However, other editors, like the big ones in charge, unfortunately, like uh, Whitney Ellsworth, I believe the guy's name was, he uh, he wanted to replace Kane. You know, he would like quote unquote suggest to Bob Kane, saying, "Hey, why don't you replace that?" Uh, that Bill Finger. I mean, he's taking way too long. And, you know, it's... I, I get the sense that through a lot of it... Again, we, I don't want to... By no means... Do, I don't think you want to do this either, Mr. I don't, I, we don't want to villainize Bob King, because he's not a villain. <laughs> exactly. He's, he's not a villain. But he, well, we'll definitely admit, and the evidence is kind of against him, on how Bill Finger did create more bat, more of the Batman we know than Bob Kane. But again, Bob Kane, very influential and Particular areas, mainly that visual, that the visual look, and again, just kind of bringing back these characters. Yeah, so we gotta give him, we gotta give him credit for that. And of course, he had the mayor, Bob Kane. He's also he's the face for Batman in the media. He was the Stan Lee in his day. Exactly. Before Stan Lee himself was that big back yeah. in the day. I mean, yeah. And that could be oh, easily debated that he was the Stan Lee of his day because you had other creators in the Marvel section, and then you had Joe. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, whichever one wrote it. So it could be debated, but when it comes to the Batman characters and the stories and all that, that was Bill Finger. Another thing you have to remember, uh, speaking of Jerry uh, Siegel and Joe Schuster, along with Bill Finger, they were uh, treated terribly when they worked for uh, when they were for DC by their editors, like particularly you know uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. They would get absolutely back in the day. They got absolutely 
almost absolutely no credit, much like Bill Finger did. However, luckily, those guys, they had a lot of people pulling for them because they created the first superhero. Like, Neil Adams had this whole campaign in the 70s when the Superman movie was in the works to give them uh, to give them credit and to give them royalties. And they basically we even go back so far as to get their uh, get their names in the book. You get their names, like, say, in uh, Superman by Jerry and uh, Jerry Siegel and Joel Schuster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame that couldn't have been done for Bill Fingers because it was kind of, uh, at that point, it was uh, a little late. You know, Batman uh, Batman came after the Superman movie, and by that time, uh, I believe uh, Bill Finger had passed. So it was a little, I guess it was a little late for him by that part. But yeah, Bill Finger, he would get chewed out by a lot of editors in front of people. Like, he would like get yelled at by his bosses, again, about being kind of, being kind of slow. Uh, Wait, I can, slow, just, hey. I can say the modern version of that, the person... Like of the person that takes his time and all that and makes sure his stuff is good is Gary Frank. Because oh, yeah. when they announced Batman Earth One, they said, oh, it was going to be released in 2010. It took two years after they, after 2010 for that book to actually come out. But let me tell you, but that art in Batman Earth One is so amazing. That it's kind of good to know that he took his time. Yeah, you can't rush perfection. Then again, there is a cutoff date at, at certain points. Don't get me wrong. For me, I love getting the, the Scott Snyder Batman monthly, but that's like the only complaint I really have about the book is I have to wait a month for it. But then again, it's when you love something, you get stuff of good quality. I can't blame them for being a little impatient because, oh, Bill, what are you doing? You're creating this great stuff here. I want to read it. Come on, hurry up, man. But you can't rush perfection. But, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, it wasn't just for that, though. I mean, Bill Finger would get chewed out just, you know, for being, just for being there, because back, back in those days, editors really didn't treat their artists or their writers with a lot of respect, because I guess they didn't have to. I mean, they, they do have to, because, I mean, they're great. Why would you back, take advantage? They were, it was just, oh, they're just employees. They're just, yeah. like, it easily replaced. Where in, Dime a dozen. Where nowadays, it's just that if you replace someone who is amazing on one particular book and it was just like oh we dropped him and we're replacing him with this guy but the person you dropped was amazing on that book the fans will go crazy yeah but uh let, let's get into uh let's get back into the issue of credits so let, let, let's just mr you and i let's kind of imagine how bill finger felt after you know he, he wasn't the reason Bill Finger didn't get the credits uh, for Batman was this: uh, back uh, when Batman, uh, sorry, when Bob Kane walked into DC with the Batman designs Monday, you know, after he took the weekend to you know, work with Bill Finger on the design, he walked in there alone because he was the first guy to approach him. Bill, he, the guy didn't even hear of Bill Finger. He just met, he met, he knew Bill Finger and just met with him in the park and they discussed some things. So he's a uh, Bob Kane's in there. He's in negotiations for the Batman character because they got love the heroes. And what's this guy called? Uh, well, that's a good question. Let me think. Uh, your wing, your creation I shall have no other wings than that of a bat. Batman. Because yeah, remember, Bob Kane did create the name, so props to him. Anyway, so uh, he basically they're in negotiations and he was signing up the contract. However, Bob Kane, he didn't mention Bill Finger. Now that's he should in all likely he really he should have mentioned. Bill Finger, yet again, you have to, you have to wonder. Bob Kane, he really just had to get his foot in the door at that moment. I guess he didn't want to make any waves. Like the way I'm thinking, I mean, again, I'm not trying to villainize Bob Kane. I'm trying to look at this from all perspectives here. So, don't I don't want to make it sound like I'm I'm his attorney or anything, but I'm being fair here. Okay. Based on what I've researched, um, it said that Bob Kane was like, wait, as you said, he. When he didn't even mention, it was kind of like when they first like brought it up. Bob Kane negotiated a contract with National Comics, the future DC Comics. Yeah. And he signed away the ownership of the character, among other compensations. All he wanted was a mandatory byline on all Batman comics and ad adaptations there thereof. So it was kind of like Bill Finger was never even given a chance. He was never given exactly. a chance to sign a contract. To actually say, oh, I'll, I'll get my credit on there as well. But. Well, the way I, I'm figuring, again, I don't want to say like, I'm just the guy's attorney or anything, but I, I, I want to say, like, optimistically, I would like to say that 
it's Bob Gaines. He's trying to get his foot. This is a big opportunity. Mind you. He's come up with a big super. Uh, they've come. They, these two guys work together. They come up with a great idea for a superhero, and the, the publisher it loves it. The editor loves it. So, okay, we can actually make some stuff as he's even drawing up a contract. For pity's sake, a contract. I mean, okay, this is official business for the for the future of this character. And you know, uh, I I don't, I don't think Bob Kane wanted to make waves. He didn't want to take the risk that okay, well, wait, there's another guy we have to give credit. Well, I don't know. Like maybe like maybe he's afraid he was going to like not give him the contract or something. If he knew there was another guy involved, or okay, well, we'll have to meet with this guy. You know, maybe I'll be less interested next week about this character. Who knows? I think it might have been like a a here and now sort of deal. And if Bob can get on it, he, I guess he wanted uh, optimistically. I'm saying Bob can just want to get the thing signed and maybe deal with it later. But he never really got to that later. Yeah. That's optimistically. I could be entirely wrong on that, but that's just me looking optimistically for Bob Kane there. Yeah, and I'm also looking at this. Um, what I'm looking at, it says Finger received limited acknowledgement for his writing works in the 60s. The letters page of Batman number 169, February 1965, for example, features editor Julie Schwartz naming Finger as the creator of the Riddler. So it's yeah. kind of like back in the 60s when he was writing all this great stuff, he still wasn't getting acknowledged. It- and really, the only one that really was... There were a few people were really nice to the guy, like Julius Schwartz. He was nice to him when he gave him credit like that. Yeah. yeah. And all the other stuff that I'm looking at that it shows that he did receive credit for, he always got the second billing, like right after the artist. Like for the first Wildcat story, because he wrote Wildcat for a while, it says by Erwin Hassan and Bill Finger. And then well, he, he created – What? He created what? He helped co-create Wildcat, but again, it was – well, was he was he credited for that? Yeah, he was created like for the byline when he was writing it in Sensational Comics number one. It it had the byline of by Erwin Haston and Bill Finger, and even in the first Green Lantern story yeah. that Bill Finger created, another character he created, Green Lantern, it was credited as Mark Dellen and Bill Finger. See, Bill Finger, the writer, the person who actually does the legwork for the character is put in right behind the artist. Yeah. It's one of those things where Bill Finger should be getting more acknowledgement than what he's due. I mean, he I think he deserves more than what he's due. It's like he discovered gold, yet he's getting credit for making platinum or silver. Yeah. Or he's it's still not bad stuff, but you know, not it's not the gold that you'll never get back. You know, like I, I didn't, I invented or I discovered gold. You didn't get a patent on it. It's just so tragic. He discovered gold, but yet he's getting cold. <laughs> yeah, something, something like that. But you gotta imagine how how do you think Bill Finger felt? You know, just kind of being. Uh, not, not I don't want to say like scammed at. Well, he pretty much was kind of scammed out of it. The point is, he, not getting credit for creating this great character who amounted. He, remember, Bill Finger. He when Bill Finger was around to Batman when he's at his height at the '60s for a while. So ba- Batman was at his height. So how do you think Bill Finger felt at that time when Batman's at his most popular in the '60s? How do you think he's feeling about that? Well, at the time of the '60s, it was near the end of his. It was getting close to the end of his life, so it was kind. Of, uh, excuse me. It was kind of one of those things where it's been going on for a while, and it was probably at the point of his life where it's like, uh, it's been like this for so long, I really don't care anymore. Yeah. So imagine, he, I would imagine he would would be upset. But he, come on, Bill Finger. He was also another reason I guess he didn't pursue in the early days would be he he was described by people as an easygoing, passive guy. So it might that might have been one of the things where when all of this was happening and all this debate and all of this controversy around why he was he's not being getting given credit and all he's probably one of those he was probably the guy that was just like okay I don't know why everyone's getting in a fuss about it but okay just why does everyone relax another thing is uh, Bill Bill Singer he uh, Bill Finger, back in those days, he might have not, uh, it was the early days of comics when Batman was great. Maybe he didn't think that, you know, Batman would, uh, Batman's comics in general would last as long as they did. Maybe he thought, well, okay, it's like, that. it was just a little, well, well, it's not, it's like more than a strip, but who knows. I think 
everyone at the time, even when Superman was created, when Batman was created, I don't think that they ever suspected that those characters would last as long as they did. I don't think people go into a comic saying, oh, when I create this character, it's going to be the one character that everyone's going to remember. Everyone's going to love him. And he's going to go on. He's going to have a legacy. It was, it's probably one of those things where, hey, look, I got to create, I got a character. Why don't we just write a story? If he becomes big, great. If he doesn't, well, I'm used to it. And it's like, oh, I'm used to it. Characters not getting big. They wrote the story. They wrote everything. And now, um, we look back at it for 75 something years, 75 something years. Yeah, it's 75 years. Yeah, yeah. Since Batman was created, I mean, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it's amazing to see how long Batman has been able to go on. And it's because of Bill Finger's writing. Indeed. And I, I think like another thought that might have passed through his mind is maybe he, like, I, I guess since uh, Bill Finger, he could, he he could have fought for credit, but I think he just kind of figured it was an uphill battle, because again, artists, uh, artists and creators back in the day, uh, they didn't have much pull. Yeah. Because he, I guess, mentioned you know Jerry uh, Jerry Siegel and uh, Joe Schuster, you know not the uh, not the most lucky ducks back in the early days for Superman for Superman even. So I mean, it's an yeah. uphill battle. It's just again lucky enough to kind of get your foot in the door and have a consistent job. I guess that might have been run through his head. And also at the time when those books were being written, it was around the time when it was around Depression era, World War II was about to happen. So at the time, it was practically like, oh, the editors and editors-in-chief, the publishers, all that, they're in charge because they're the ones that control the money. They control what you're going to get. So yeah, if you write a good book and you're on their side, then you're probably going to get more money. If you go against what they say – or you write a bad book, you're either going to get kicked off, kicked out of the company, or you're not going to get a lot of money. So with the depression happening at that time, it's kind of what's the point of even going with this battle? You know, I've heard talk of a, a documentary about Bill Finger in, in the works, and you know, I think that would be a good idea because I think they're – Behind this, there, there's a story in the feelings behind this that we're not getting. I think could be interesting. Think about it. Yeah. Mystery. You got Bob Kane, you got Bill Finger. These guys, they, they're partners, they work together. And I think there's kind of, almost like the, the Sherman Brothers documentary the, the, the Disney released. It was really good stuff. It was really this touching, really involved, almost Shakespearean story. Yet for Bob Kane and Bill Finger, think about it. Bill Finger, he's doing a lot of the legwork, while Bob Kane, he's kind of the idea man, kind of came up with the symbol and so forth. But... And Bob came to his credit. He he was the initiative. Like he got his foot in the door and he kind of pushed forward. Bad. He was more of the businessman yeah. in the partnership. Where Bill Finger, of course, unfortunately not being the businessman, he's kind of getting short end. I'm I'm kind of this is, is a weird comparison, but I'm kind of picturing like a dark at the end of the Dark Knight scenario. Like think of Bob came. We used to see him in all these interviews, and he's basically the Stan Lee of his day in all these interviews for like the 60s Batman show. Or even in '89, he was big in '89 because you know, he wore the Batman jackets. He went to the premiere. In a, in a suit with a Batman cape and cowl, which is awesome. And all I have to say about that, that one particular moment, all I was thinking, when even when I saw a picture of it, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to make Bob Kane seem antagonistic or try to do anything, but it seemed like his head was five times bigger than his entire body. Well, yeah, a thing about uh, Bob Kane, just real briefly, I want to mention, he was overcome with pride, which isn't always a bad thing. I mean, he was, he's a guy, that's the thing about Bob Kane, you watch him in these interviews, he seems like such a happy guy. He created Batman, and Stan Lee, I love the idea that the creator of Batman and the creator of Spider-Man were friends, because I always kind of imagine Batman and Spider-Man be kind of friendly towards each other, that's just me. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of even when you think about it, if they were in the same book, and if Nightwing never existed, there you go, that's the, that's the friendship. Yeah. But uh, I, I kind of like uh, I like that. And Stanley will tell you, Bob Kane always inserted the fact that, hey, I'm Bob Kane, I created Batman. Yeah, which when you really think about it now, is a little, given all the stuff with Bill Finger, is a little. Uh... And also, I remember, like, I saw an interview with Stan Lee that was, um, that he said, it's like, hey, Batman's in theaters. Where's Spider Man? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, a few years later, Spider Man comes out. No Bob. No, that, that's kind of sad, I gotta say, because I, I love when Stanley tells his Bob Kane stories, but a whole now. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, the thing with uh, <clears throat> the thing with Bob Kane is that he you know he was very verbose about his his love of Batman, his creating. And you got to imagine kind of behind the scenes how he's feeling. I mean, he was. Uh, he, the, his wife told stories like Bob Kane was crying when he was in that uh, in the limo riding to the premiere of Batman. And he felt really connected to the scared. He was really proud of what he and Bill Finger created. And I gotta wonder, th- there might be a little bit of sadness along with that too. Like, yeah, maybe I I shorted Bill Finger. Of course, there's another version. Again, it could be wrong with what I'm trying to picture. Here. Maybe uh, Bob Kane. Maybe he's a bit of a Bit of a jerk who short about just doesn't care. Maybe money obsessed. I don't know this for sure, but I'm just going off the way he presented himself in the media and so forth. He's just this nice guy, really loved the fact he created Batman. He can still love the fact that he created Batman, but imagine the story, this kind of this situation like the end of the Dark Knight. Like a guy who's going to prevent mystery, a guy who's going to present himself like that in front of everyone. There's got to be some sort of sadness or some sort of regret beneath the surface, or at least some conversation between him and Bill Finger that's not that we've never seen or yeah. heard. That's like Bill Finger saying, "Look, uh, it, look, Bob, it's okay. Just you, you take the credit. I don't need credit. I'm working on the character, and that's all that matters to me." Or something along those lines. You know, the equivalent to the, uh, you know, whatever Gotham needs me to be. That's that's Bill Finger. Bill Finger. Uh, the best analogy I can work up with between Bob Kane and Bill Finger is that Bill Finger is Batman. He's the training. He's the he's the train, the legwork. He's the gadgetry. Where Bob Kane is Bruce Wayne. He's the guy who came up with the bat symbol. Yeah. So to speak. So that's that's where I, I, the biggest comparison. Bob Kane. He, in real life, he always mentioned that he loved Bruce Wayne. He always kind of well. A lot of people say he always tried to be the Bruce Wayne. That's why he wore nice suits, wore ascots in interviews. And he was kind of a mixture of the Bruce Wayne and the Penguin. And real yeah. life, yeah, it was. Mainly, he was he was Bruce Wayne. That's the lifestyle he lived up. He was the public face for Batman, where Bill Finger is actually Batman. He's the guy in the shadows doing the work. He's the one fighting crime, so to speak, on the pages. And it, it's kind of an interesting way to think about it, wouldn't you say, Mister? That, that, in my opinion, that's probably a great analogy that I yeah that I can think of because everyone knows who Bob Kane is. He created Batman. Whenever someone brings up the name Bill Finger. People have to think a little bit, and then when they can't think of it, they're just like, "Who is that?" It's like, "Oh, that guy helped create Batman. He's the writer of Batman." It's like, "Oh, I, I didn't. I thought Bob Kane did all that." But it, you're, you're right. Bob Kane is Bruce Wayne. Bill Finger is Batman. Yeah, I always, again, on documentary, I would just love to see what, what that thing that's the unsaid thing, like how would these two talk to each other after that they worked together on the character for this many years. You want to have see that conversation or like how these two interacted, just kind of that one thing saying, it's okay, I don't need the credit, or just saying, hey, I want credit. Or no, we don't know. I just, I'd love to see how that would you know transpire because it has to be this big thing. Maybe just kind of, if event, something like that was shown, it would give so much more meaning to the scene Bob came in these interviews. Like, oh, maybe there's an element of sadness there, or maybe not, or maybe this Big thing went down. We don't know. Wouldn't that be interesting to see in the documentary mystery or oh, something? Oh, yeah, that would be perfect to see in the documentary. Or even if we wanted to, even if they wanted to, make a biopic. Yeah. Of yeah. Like, make a biopic of the creators of Batman. Granted, people might not watch it and all that. It'd probably be like a small independent film for us yeah. Batman fans who want to know the making and the story behind all this. But it's it's just one of those things where people might need to think about it a little more. Well, a thing you have to remember the Disney uh, the Disney documentaries that are really good, by the way, like the Sherman Brothers are waking sleep Beauty. Technically, they're they're kind of independent films. They're made by the people who were involved with Disney. Yes, but it's like they just only got the royalties so they can say Disney or use Disney affiliated things. It's not like Disney's actually putting money. That's like. The Sherman Brothers is made about the, the Sherman Brothers, and it's made by their sons. So it's technically made by the Sherman Cousins. It's basically the sons of these great men who put their own money into the thing, making the movie. Take it to a distributor. It's basically indie films that are documentaries, and they're really good. And I think the same could be done for for Bill Finger, which could be awesome, you know, whether it be a biopic or, or a documentary. But let, getting back to uh, – you know, getting back to – to uh to Bill Finger again, it could be like a Dark Knight scenario when the history of those two could be really awesome to see. But uh, uh <clears throat> sorry, as as for mentioned, so like in, Bob Kane's the the public face of Bruce Wayne. Bill Finger, he, he he's the Batman. And behind the scenes, from what I know about the personal life of uh, of Bill Finger, he was married twice. 
Uh, first wife, uh, it's uh, Portia or Portia. I think it's a P O R T I A. I think that's uh, Portia. Mm-hmm. Could be wrong. I think Portia makes it. Anyway, uh, to the, together they sired a son, uh, Fred Finger, who unfortunately died at uh, an early age, 1992. So, I mean, he outlived his father, but still, it's. A shame. Not that long. Yeah, yeah, that's tragic. But uh, there is one person who uh, uh, Bill Finger did remarry uh, years later. I'm wondering if maybe the uh, the uh, kind of the, the strain, because from what I hear, he had a bit of a temper. But it was like they we don't know that much about the personal life of Bill Finger, so we don't know if it's entirely like, out of control or not. But I'm assuming it can maybe put it a little bit of a strain. Like he's creatively frustrated that he's not getting credit for this. Maybe. Mm-hmm. I could be stretching with that, but maybe he's a little frustrated when he comes home from a long day's work. Hey, listen, I I helped contribute to this great thing. It's like he's kicking himself, well, much like like uh, another example being uh, like uh, Billy Crystal was offered the role of Buzz Lightyear. He was kicking himself ever since, since he turned it down. And, That's why he took Mike Wazowski. And also, um, the way you're saying it, it's kind of reminding me of the great comedy duo. And I'm bringing this comedy now. The great comedy duo of Martin and Lewis, where I watched a TV movie of of like their interaction to where Jerry Lewis was creating all of the stuff. He wanted to be the face. And Dean Martin, yeah, he was being recognized, but he really didn't want to have a say in it. He was just holding everything back. So it kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. Even though, like, just one other... Comedy duo to kind of highlight real briefly. Like Abbott and Costello, don't get me wrong, they both had equal face time and equal part in the act. However, you have to remember the money split back then was 60 40 because comedians were a dime a dozen and it was a good straight man, it was hard to find. So, yeah, a lot of partnerships uh, and just throughout history have been kind of they're either one sided or like someone's you know not getting the better end of the deal and yet they're really bringing a lot to the act. You know, Luke Costello, he's the real hilarity of the act, but like uh, Bud Abbott, he's more the He's more like funny when you think about it, sort of comedy. Like, oh, this guy, he doesn't pay much mind to Luke Costello. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah but there is, a, unfortunately, a, the Bill Finger clan is pretty much, uh, has pretty much died out. A few members have passed in recent years. Uh, his son, uh, unfortunately, I have to say... Uh, his son again. His son passed away. However, luckily, despite his son, uh, his son was uh, was gay in real life, which I think put another strain because you know Bill Finger was a man of uh, of an earlier time, so I may, yeah. that might put some strain on the two. But uh, uh, his son did uh, did sire a daughter at some point, and that daughter is alive today, and that's uh, Athena Finger. Well, we don't know if she's married or not. So. Oh right. Well, well assuming she's yeah, fair point, but. Assuming she's not married, I think I think she still kept the finger name from what I heard, but I could be wrong on that. Point is, and she's kind of like the last heir to the finger name, so she's like the only one who could technically fight for the rights of Bill Finger. And she was if she born wanted. in 1976, two years after Bill Finger's death. Yes, so it's kind of like one light goes out, another one comes into this world. Unfortunately, uh, well, I mean, after uh, after his first marriage ended, uh, Bill Finger he. Uh, Met uh, uh, Lynn Simons, you know, good good for him, getting some happiness in the world. But uh, unfortunately, Bill Finger, he passed away in uh, 1974, and unfortunately, he didn't have much because he was kind of short out of the big deal with Batman. He would have been set for life. If he, had, I think, if he would have fought for the for trying to get credited a little more for creating Batman, he either he would have lost or he would have won. It's well, that's every case. But I mean, when I say he might have lost, I'm saying that if he would have lost, it would have been one of those things where I don't think he would have minded. He would have minded. It's like okay, I brought, I gave a good fight, so okay, hurrah for me. But if he would have won, it would have been one of those things where people would be looking at Batman differently. They would not just be thinking of oh, it's just Bob Kane. They would be seeing it as Bob Kane and Bill Finger. It's both of them, not just one of them. That would have been, I tell you, that would have been great. But again, it was a real. If he did try, it would have been really one side. I mean, it took for uh, the, for the shoot for Jared Siegel and Schuster. It took Neil Adams to really head a whole thing of like a bunch of artists and get a lot. Neil Adams started to think getting a lot of people behind the cause. I mean, Bill Finger. I don't know the latest before 
really before Neil Adams, like maybe a few years before he started working at DC because Neil Adams is really big in the 70s working with O'Neill. But before that, I mean, it might have been really one side. and It's kind of like a guy, like the one guy in the room trying to scrounge together an army. Well, I think Julie Schwartz might have helped Bill Finger a little bit. And That's since a good he, point. And since he was the editor at the time, I think he could have gotten, he would have helped a whole lot. That's a good point. That's a, that's a good point. But then again, he's an editor, so he might have more ties to the company. So he like literally cannot do that, or else he would lose his job. We don't know. I, I don't know myself. I'm not, not a legal expert or anything. But if to anyone who is listening to this, if you're a legal person, write in the comments if we're right or not. Thank you if you do. But uh, yeah, the, the, you know what the real tragic thing is, and the real tragedy from what what I heard. Recently, I heard recently on a, on a podcast talking about Bill Finger. I heard that when Bill Finger died, he didn't get an obituary. What? He didn't get a good funeral, barely a funeral. And again, I don't know how much of his family was around, but regardless, didn't really get a funeral. Well, it would have – based on how many people of his family are alive, it would have been his first wife. Who, yeah, they might have had like strain, but nonetheless – even if you're like an ex-wife, you still have to go to a funeral. You still got to think of the good times that you had. He had his then wife. He had his son, and then that would have been his family that I know of. So, and then it, you might have had Bob Kane and his family because they probably were good friends. They, you would have practically had almost. A, you would have probably had a lot of people from DC Comics probably help out who should have helped out. And when it comes yeah. to the obituary, I mean. It's Bill Finger. He wrote Batman. He needs I gotta say, obituary. When a when a such a talented writer dies, it's insulting not to give him a, an obituary. And he was a talented writer. You know what he got? The only thing he got was like in a magazine, like just kind of a fan magazine. He got there's one one little blurb about him saying uh, Bill Finger the tra- like one little article saying uh, Bill Finger tragically uh, passed away. But that was like it's in a fan magazine. It's not even an actual paper. Uh, That's sad. You, he, I, for some reason, this is just this popped in my mind. He wasn't even credited after death. Yeah, that's that's horrible. He, even though, yes, he can. Sure, he doesn't have to be credited for creating Batman. He doesn't need to be credited for creating what's happened. But when a man dies. He must be credited. Yeah. I mean, forgive me if I'm if I'm comparing apples and oranges here, because I don't think I really am that much, because these these two men had great contributions. But I mean, that's almost am- along the lines of not crediting Heath Ledger for The Dark Knight. Exactly. In a way. If, yeah, because these like yeah. if they would never have credited Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, it's like. Oh, here's the poster. Here are the actors. Wait, he thought he was playing the Joker. It's like, oh, we're not putting him up there. And then it's like in the end credits, he's still not up there. It's one of well, those things where every single person in the theater would be pissed because this is Heath Ledger. He gave the performance of a lifetime. If if not that, if I'm overstretching with that, that with that statement, I could it could also be just like what if they didn't say in memoriam to Heath Ledger or, or special thanks to our friend Heath Ledger? If that wasn't in there, that'd be insulting. Also, that would saying, be you know, like, insulting. Oh. Yeah, I mean, what? It's one thing like if it was like the film was completely finished at at one point. That that's another thing entirely. But I mean, if like they just they knew this and they didn't put it in there, which is the case for DC, they knew Bill Finger. They hired Bill Finger, and the thing is, after he was knew his work. But they no none. It's like even though people knew his work, everyone knew him. Everyone in DC knew him. Julie Schwartz, Bob Kane, someone could have at least wrote the obituary. Yeah. And I know yeah. him and his son might have been had a strained relationship. His son should have sent something in. Well, I think his son was a kid at that age, so I'm not sure. But uh, uh, well, 74, so I don't know how old the kid would have been. Well, but, uh, he he had his. Fred had his daughter two years after, so he couldn't be oh, that young. You're right. Sorry. Yeah, but, uh, it's a fair point then. Fair point. So it was something like that, where someone close to him should have done an obituary. Yeah. 
And I bet you Bob Kane and his obituary obituary. Yeah, I mean Bob Kane. He uh, he has his he has a rather lovely headstone to be honest with you. It's this thing where it's an open book and a bat signals on it. So he uh, he got a great headstone, a Batman themed headstone. Where's that for for uh, for Bill Finger? Which, by the way, speaking of headstone, I got to mention this. He didn't even get. He doesn't even have a tombstone, Mister E. Okay. Did you hear me? He yeah. doesn't have a tombstone. How insulting that, okay. is that? Okay, either. Either his family was really cheap, or either his family was really poor, or they just didn't want to spend the money. Well, from what I understand, he didn't have enough money to get buried, even. I mean, he had to be cremated, because, you know, he didn't, just didn't get as much royalties, any cash to have that as an option, which is really tragic. But also, the... Uh, I think there's a thing in his autobiography saying that he was uh, he was cremated and he was his son, Fred, uh, took him to a beach and he uh, like scattered the ashes. Unfortunately, like the it made it sound real tragic to like the tide swept up and took it away, which is kind of kind of sad that happens to the guy. Like he had that as an option. If that is entirely the case, that he didn't want to be cremated, he would want to be buried. Yet he can't. You want to be buried, but that's not a viable option. That's really sad. Even his last wish not being met. I mean, you know, it's... Assuming that's the case, that's sad. It was now, one or the other. Now, I don't know. I can't say for sure. I'm just saying, from I heard this from the expert on Bill Finger, that he did not get an obituary, a funeral, or a tombstone. This is the man who wrote a book about him. This is the man who's basically, along with the... Po uh, we have to see how things play out with the daughter, Athena, in the future. But right now, he's basically the only lineage Bill Finger has left. This is the guy who swears like swears on a, on a stack of Batman comics on this, and in a good way. I mean, as like the equivalent to the Bible. We, this, we, either, we may – someone may need to speak to Athena to see if, there, if it, it will be fine for them to put a tombstone at the grave because I'm just saying – he deserves one. He he does. He he absolutely he absolutely does. But yeah, you gotta you gotta wonder. I mean, this guy he goes through life. He creates practically something that's even an awesome version of Santa Claus that fights crime, essentially. You know, basically the one of the best things ever, one of the best heroes ever. I mean, alongside Superman. I mean, they are basically the architects for every superhero and invention. And he doesn't he doesn't get a, a funeral, an obituary, a tombstone. That's that's not right. However, in terms of just how the world because you have to remember in the, I mean in the sixties he was basically let go. And the, the the sad part is I know we kind of mentioned this, but the sad part was he was working there for so long and he was basically a ghostwriter for all those years. And after that he kind of left uh, he left DC. He was still writing stuff, but he was still pretty much. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't as well known stuff. I mean, if it was cred, it was very low key stuff. Yeah, which is a shame. I mean, that might I don't know how. I, maybe that's a reason Bob Kane didn't write an obituary. I'm not sure exactly because I don't know how things were when they left during the '60s. Because again, I could be stretching. He might have been a little embittered when the '60s show is getting so popular and he doesn't have any cred, or maybe just maybe I'm done with this. And maybe when DC's pushing for him to be let go, he doesn't want to really rush back to him. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? But again, keep in mind, he was one of the rare writers from the comic who did get the right in episode of the 60s Batman show. So, again, a little bit of conflicting stuff there. So I don't know for certain. But I want to say this. Uh, Bob Kane did have a have a, a reference to Bill Finger because, unfortunately, again, Bob Kane, villain or no villain, we don't know. I like yeah. the, I know one uh, thing in Green Lantern, the more recent Green Lantern comics. They tributed his work and all that, or they did like they made a tribute character for him, which is hilarious when you think of the character. Well, you have to remember, uh, Willie Bill Finger he created the Gar the the Alan Scott Green Lantern. Yes, and later on in the comics, they made they as a tribute to for his work in DC Comics, the Green Lantern character William Hand is named after him. Oh yeah, get it hand with fin oh that's nice. Black hand is of a villain 
is named after the great Bill Finger. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, yeah. Well, the thing with the uh, Bob Kane, he, he didn't really acknowledge Bill Finger. And I would watch documentaries like Bob Kane and me. It's a wonderful documentary on the Gotham Knight DVD. And also, Dark Knight Returns, they re-released it on. But the uh, thing is, uh, in that documentary, uh, I've heard, like, uh, Bob Kane doesn't mention Bill Finger. I watched it, and he does. People talk about, mention Bill Finger. But it's not Bob Kane in any of his interviews, because he publicly... Never mentioned Bill Finger, except for one time. In this one time, uh, towards the end of Bob Kane's life, he was, he was getting towards the end. And Bob Kane, and I want to, I want to take this for face value, to be honest with you. Just kind of preserve a good memory of Bob Kane, just kind of a, a good memory on the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Bob Kane wished he could go back 15 years to when he met, to when he met uh, Bill Finger, and give Bill the, he said, you know, give Bill credit for uh, his contribution to Batman. But again, this is towards the end of his life, so it could be him just trying to get things out in the open before he passes, or it could be actually how he felt. Could be, yeah, like leaving a good taste in the mouth before he before he leaves to uh, another world, so to speak. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, I, I, I want to say Bob Kane did try to truly regret it. Again, I, could be a good thing for a documentary. I don't know. Well, whatever the truth Maybe, but he says he wish he could go back 15 years and give him credit. I want to take that for face value. I really do. You know, when you're overcome with pride, you know, you don't know what's going to come out of that. Overcome with pride, you know, can be a can be a great thing, but you have to marry the people you might hurt with that. And that was Bill Finger. Yeah. But on a positive note, just so we're not all gloom and doom here about Bill Finger, because we got to remember he uh, had a lot of great contributions. You just made me gloom. I'm going to brighten you up, sir. You know why? We're going to talk about a shiny award. That award is the Bill Finger Award, celebrating after Bill Finger's passing. And I like to say this kind of – this doesn't make up for the lack of tombstone, but this makes up for uh, for kind of like how people – and people – for anyone who's kind of forgotten the contributions to Bill Finger. This – the Bill Finger Award – Well, I'm looking at it, and it says the premise of the award was – to recognize writers for a body of work that has not received its rightful award and or recognition. Exactly. That, that was what Jerry Robinson intended as his way to remember his friend Bill Finger. Bill is still kind of the industry poster boy for writers not receiving proper reward or recognition. I got to say, that's, that's a lovely sentiment from Jerry Robinson. I really have to say. Unfortunately, Jerry, Jerry Robinson has passed in recent years, and that's that's unfortunate. But you know, that was a, a wonderful thing he he did for Bill Finger because again, it is a tragedy that a writer of that caliber, a writer of Bill Finger's caliber, and the, the contributions he's made. Whether Batman to this day is still a man, well, back in the early days as a guy as a vigilante using a gun, but seeing how far he's come, seeing how many iterations, how many evolutions Batman has been through, and all the lives he's touched, and all the characters that have spun off from Batman, or supporting characters, or villains, or whoever have gotten credit, that it all started. From that, that Bill Finger writing that initial story and Bob Kane drawing drawing that story and kind of saying let's let's bring these guys back let's it's a perfect team up they were Batman Robin of the day they were two sides of the same Batman it's good stuff yes yeah but uh, the other here's another great thing I gotta mention since we I mentioned the documentary like a, what we'd like to see from a documentary possibly or a biopic or something. Uh, Mark Tyler Nobleman, he wrote a book, a wonderful book, a book for all ages, but still is compelling to all ages as well. This guy, he goes to schools and he promotes this book, and kids are still wrapped up in it, and that just that does my heart well. Bill the Boy Wonder. Now, this book is wonderfully illustrated by Ty Templeton, about a Batman artist currently, and just an artist for DC currently. Work good in the world of Batman, that guy. This book, it highlights all the stuff we've talked about here today, Mr. E. The history of uh, Bill Finger, the lesser known, from the beginnings to, uh, it's kind of a, it's a tragic, tragic story, but, you know, glimmers of hope here and there and just kind of makes you, makes you pull for the guy. And what uh, Mark Tyler Noman does, that uh, he would go to schools, and he's mentioned this, 
Uh, he, he would go to schools and assemblies and so forth, kids who don't want to be there. He would tell them the story of Bill Finger, and they would be compelled. They would hear the fact, you know, there's no obituary, no funeral, no tombstone, and they would get outraged. And they would think, how could this happen? They would rush up to this, these uninterested kids, would run up to the stage, and they'd say, oh, tell me more, please. This Bill Finger guy, what can we do to say? Just, you know, tell people, just mention Bill Finger. That's really what you can do. I mean, he did this great stuff for you, this great stuff for the character. So everyone be entertained. That's really he was did this without ever asking for his name to be mentioned. He could he lived with that, and that's the way you really thank him. Mention his name. Bill Finger really is when you think about it. He's the best line in Batman in Batman Begins. Remember, you don't have it's, you don't have to thank me, and you'll never have to. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's a one. It's wonderful that I think of it. I'm just thinking about this now. That's really what he was. He was the guy you did. He was Batman. That's the most simple way I can put it. Bill Finger, he was more than a boy wonder, not to discredit the, that wonderful book. He is, he's Batman. But at yeah, risk of repeating myself here, another thing i got to mention about Mark Teller Nobleman, because this is most recently. Uh, Nobleman has been uh, campaigning, again, uh, he, was the, he was the man I mentioned earlier as the, as the, uh, the go-to guy for uh, Bill Finger. He's like the surviving... Guy, he basically this Bill the Boy Warner is an is a autobiography. Well, maybe not autobiography. It is a biography about Bill Finger, and he's the one who's tracked down the theme of the daughter, the last lineage of a of the, of the Finger name, and he's like been in talks with her so we can try to get a documentary going. In fact, so he's working on that currently as we speak. But also, in addition to that, kind of stepping stone to that, and most recently, and by the time this video is out, it might be in time. Most likely, it will be out of out of time, but just something he's he worked on. Definitely is getting uh, Bill Finger a Google Doodle. You know the Google Doodle is, right, Mister E? Yeah. So basically, uh, so basically, this Google Doodle, he, uh, you, you click on this thing, you learn about the person, and uh, Bill Finger's 100th birthday is is coming up, it's February 8th. Is coming up, and he wanted to. Uh, it's since it's a, such a big, big occasion, you know, the 100th birthday. He wanted to do it for Dark Knight Rises, but you know, he didn't really pan out that well. You know, going for uh, the 100th birthday and getting him a Google Doodle, so more people learn about this guy, learn about his contributions to Batman. Because you know, Batman in this year, Batman's turning 75, and Bill Finger's turning 100. I mean, it's kind of in sync when you think about it. Because in May, Batman turns 75. And I would love, I would love it because basically, uh, what you would do is you would send in the proposals at Google.com, and you would say, "Give uh, Bill Finger a Google Doodle," and basically, you know, so people click on, they learn about him, and hopefully that will pave the pave the way. Even if it doesn't go, if this doesn't work out. Hopefully, regardless, uh, they'll be able to make this documentary or this uh, biopic work because the way he talked about doing it on Fat Man on Batman. Uh, 53, which is where I heard a lot of these these great Bill Finger facts, by the way. i got to give that podcast all the credit in the world for Kevin Smith having Mark Tyler Nobleman on there to talk about Bill Finger in such uh, such regard, such honor. Uh, he mentioned he wanted to do this in a kind of an auto a bio a biopic style, so basically he would explore an uh, actor playing Bill Finger and ex- basically be a biopic for Bill Finger as a documentary, which could be cool, right? Yes. All I'm saying is that whoever is doing this for Bill Finger, they, they're, they're amazing because with them doing this, this is practically saying Bill Finger will finally get the recognition that he deserves. Yeah. Yeah, this is given this. He's being, uh, like the way Kevin Smith phrased it was, it was giving, uh, he's the white knight for Bill Finger. He was like the like the White Knight for Bill Finger, like Harvey Dent was. Not the Dark Knight, the White Knight. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's great. Yeah, Mark, tell him, but if you're listening to this, you know, thank you, and you know, thank you for putting Bill Finger in the conscious. Thank you for informing me of some of these surprising facts about Bill Finger. I always heard about Bill Finger. I always thought, actually, I I remember Miss Vig Miss vehemently a, a memory. I went to a Comic Con once, and I heard like that someone taking a Q and A. And uh, like uh, to one of the editors and publishers of DC Comics, and to one of uh, someone in the crowd raised their hand. They said, uh, "What would, the question posed? What would you like to see from DC Comics?" And he said, "I got to raise his hand." He said, 
I like to see uh, all the old Batman comics have Bill Finger's name on it. Along with Bob Kane's, you know, Bob created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Yes. Unfortunately, that didn't come to pass, but you know. In the day and age where Neil Adams can, back in the 70s, can get, rally together everyone, give Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster a name, you know, maybe it's not a lost cause. Who knows? That was a big thing, though. So, regardless, we got to get people to know about Bill Finger. That's why I, I recruited you, Mr. E, for this cause, because his 100th birthday is coming up. He gave us over 1,500 stories, by the way. Yeah. Over 1,500 stories. 1,500. If it was not for Bill Finger and giving us those that many stories, if it wasn't for Bill Finger giving us those many stories, and was that just for Batman? Uh, I believe it's 1,500 for Batman, but in addition to the other stories, he goes, it's over 1,500. Well, the 1,500 plus stories that he is giving us for Batman, Green Lantern, Wildcat, and all those other characters, if it was not for him, these characters would not be what they are today. With Batman, he created Batman. He created the Dark Knight. Now look at where Batman is now. He is practically at the peak of everyone's, like, top, like, the top ten, or, heck, top two superhero list. When you look at Green Lantern, yes, at the time, Green Lantern, he was a big character. They recreated everything. They got a different Green Lantern. But nonetheless, they brought the original Green Lantern back. And now, look, in the New 52, they have a complete separate universe just for that one Green Lantern to be, to shine and become number one. Yes, they've changed the character a little bit, but still, it's the same character. When we go to Wildcat, yes, I don't think he's in the comics that much now. I'm not for sure. I haven't read a lot of stuff with Wildcat in it. But still, if you looked at the original 52 of New Earth before they rebooted it, he was number, he was one of the top heroes that you wanted. He was on the Justice Society. He was the one that trained Black Canary. He was the one that if you wanted boxing tips, if you needed help fighting, you go to him. You learn how to be a hero and fight with him. So because of Bill Finger, we have characters like that that will forever be immortal and that no care and no one could ever destroy them. They may try. They may be like, oh, how about we kill Batman? You tried that before. It didn't last. Oh, why don't we kill Green Lantern? You tried that. It didn't last. So Bill Finger created characters that will forever live on in comic book history in fan history, in forever, in the plethora of superheroes that have been around. I I would never want to exist in a multiverse that didn't have Bill Kane, that, that didn't have Bill Finger in it. I'd never want to exist in a multiverse that didn't have Bill Finger in it. Because he, no Bill Finger, no Batman the Animated Series, no Bill Finger, no Batman, period. No other superheroes, really, I mean, without... Such the big hit as Batman. Who knows what we could have gotten as our second superhero? May never have come, for all we know. If we did come, it would have been lame. Who knows? Batman, it, we, we started out strong in regard to superheroes, and without that, we, there'd be no Marvel without Bill Kane. I know I'm, I'm extrapolating here, but it makes sense. We, look, the point is, I know Batman the Amateur is what got me to love the character, and you know what should be there? It should say, created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger. But you know what? His, his ambiance is there, because he did the work. Whether it's known or not, it should definitely, most definitely be known. But you know, Bill Finger, if, if you're listening out there, if you're listening... Wait, I, I Bill say, Finger? Bill Finger. Oh. If, if you're in heaven listening, just listen. Yeah. Bill Finger. Happy from me, mystery, from everyone... Everyone listening, everyone who's ever read a Batman comic, anyone who's ever watched Batman the Animated Series like I did, anyone who's 60 show, 89 Nolan film, video game, I don't care. Everything. Even a su even Superman. Even Superman fans. We wouldn't get the um, a Man of Steel crossover, Batman, Superman, who knows? We wouldn't get any of that without, without you, sir. And I have to say, on this momentous occasion, happy 100th birthday, Bill Finger. From the bottom of my heart, I have to say thank you for creating such a great hero. He's my favorite superhero. He's my favorite hero. He's a hero to many. Thanks. 
Happy birthday, Bill Finger. You know, the way I like to think that Bill Finger would like to be remembered is a silent guardian, a wonderful writer, the co-creator, Bill Finger. Thanks for joining me, Mr. E. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. I'm glad I had you by my side talking about Bill Finger on this most momentous of occasions. Thank you again. You're quite welcome. Now, how about you hit us with a, with a riddle for the occasion uh, on our way out? Would you be so kind as to do that for us, sir? Uh, sure. How about this? Riddle me this. Riddle me that. This man not only had a finger, but he also had a hand in creating the world's greatest detective.